Hello, and welcome to our weekly Sunday morning service at Woodlawn Baptist Church in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. We hope you're blessed with this message. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 16. And we're going to read the first 11 verses. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 11. And I'll first read it right out of the NIV version, which you, you have in your few Bibles. And I know that the NIV has changed a little bit since, since those were printed in somewhere around 84. So, uh, so I made sure what I'm reading matches that, the pew Bibles. But I know some, so anyway, just so it doesn't cause confusion. Here's God's word to us this morning. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a, a, a while, or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door of, for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. If Timothy comes, See to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he, sorry, he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I, ex I am expecting him along with the brothers. Let's just pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd open your word to us. Help us, oh God, to not only hear the word, but Lord, make it resonate with, deep within us. Open our hearts, oh God, to your word. Holy Spirit, come and uh, illuminate your word to us, oh God. Lord, I pray that you'd take me out of, out of the picture and let your word speak. Through, through my lips, O oh God, but let it be your word to your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my question to you today is, how consistently do you support the work of the Lord? How consistently? And there's a reason why I asked it that way. How consistently? Because of what is in this scripture. It says, on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Now I want to tell you first, there's a story, this is an actual happening. There's a lady who is a friend of our church. She doesn't often attend, but she has made it her point to save up her loose coins and small bills over the course of the year. And in the spring, she always bundles all this money up and sends it in for our campership fund. And each year, this one lady sends at least two, sometimes three kids to camp. And that's just with her spare change. How does she do it? By keeping in mind her goal of sending kids to a gospel advancing camp. And by setting aside just a little at a time. That's what she does. Just a little at a time. A little here, a little there, and it all adds up. And kids are blessed through that. Through this last chapter of 1 Corinthians, 
I believe Jesus is calling each of us in our local church to the wise use of our resources. Like this lady with her campership jar, we need to keep our goals in mind and take small steps toward those goals on a continual basis. There's a, one of the Bible translators, Eugene Peterson, he called all of the Christian life a long obedience in the same direction. When we think about that, that's what, it's the goal, not just in our money, but in everything, a long obedience in the same direction. And I remember our missionary, Stan de la Cour, some of you do too, standing up here saying that the Christian life looks like taking a step of faith and then a step of obedience step of faith, a step of obedience. And what does he mean? He said it means that sometimes we don't, we're not sure how is God going to meet our needs. And we're, we're not exactly sure. But we take a little step of faith. We trust Him. And then the next step is because we saw that that worked and we want to obey. So we take another step. And in that way, God guides our steps. The word of the Lord is a lamp unto our feet. Right? It's not always uh, high beams letting you see miles down the road. Oftentimes we don't know what's down the road. All we know is what is right before our feet. We need to keep stepping out of faith, trusting our Heavenly Father to provide for us and then continuing to step forward in obedience. And what did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And what was he talking about? Jesus was talking about food and clothing, you know, all of our meeting our daily needs. All of these things will be added to you. And, and that's mentioned both in Matthew and in Luke. In this portion of 1 Corinthians, we're instructed about some of our resources. And Warren Wearsby, he breaks these resources down into just three categories. He said our, our money is talked about, our opportunities, and then our people. And those are three resources that we as a church have. We, we may not have lots. We don't have as much as some countries. But we do have some of each. Some money, some opportunities, and some people. And as we look around, some, some people have been here long enough to remember when this, this uh, sanctuary would be filled to overflow. Right? I've heard tales of the sanctuary choir and the balcony choir, which is way up there, right? you know? and, and uh, them having to weed out who gets to be in, in everything. Uh, we should be so lucky, so fortunate. But here we are with what we have. And the Lord has blessed us, and He is blessing us. And so let's look at, first, the money, the money. A collection for God's people, your gift to Jerusalem. Now why? Why was money being collected for Jerusalem? Paul was actually in Ephesus at the time, which he says during that passage. He says, I, I have a, a door of opportunity opening to me in Ephesus. But he's writing to the Corinthians, and he's saying, you, I've, I've instructed the churches in Galatia, and I'm instructing you to take up a collection, an offering for the church at Jerusalem. Now we know the church of Jerusalem was first. So why were they taking up a collection? Well, number one, because of the day of Pentecost. Think about this. On the day of Pentecost, foreigners heard the gospel preached by Peter. What was that gospel? He kept coming back to this Jesus. This Jesus. Were there other people named Jesus? Yes. Have you ever met somebody else? I know lots of them um, down in Providence. A lot of kids named Jesus. <laughs> but but um, this Jesus, he said, whom you crucified. This Jesus God raised up from the dead. This Jesus God made both Lord and Christ. This was in within weeks of the resurrection. And Peter, the same one who had denied Jesus when it was happening, right in the middle of the whole crucifixion, and we're going to go over that if, you know, as we walk through 
Holy Week once again and the happenings then, this St. Peter had denied Jesus the night, in just days before. And now here he is standing up in front of people that he know full well could arrest him and crucify him. And he's saying to them boldly, this Jesus whom you crucified is now both Lord and Christ. He's the one, the promised one. And that God raised him from the dead. Not a story he made up. You know, those people who would say, well, you know, Christianity, it's a made up story. Peter was adamant to say, I didn't make this up. I'm not risking my life over a, a fairy tale. This happened. I saw him with my own eyes. Jesus raised from the dead. And it convinced people. How many people? What did they say? 3,000 people? 3,000 people came that day. Not even counting the days afterwards based on their testimony. So the church grew tremendously right away. But many of them were foreigners. They had come from other places. They heard the, the apostles uh, proclaiming the glories of God in, in their home languages, and they stayed. And they joined the local church in Jerusalem. But many of them had limited resources. When you're on vacation, you bring enough for your vacation. You're not expecting to stay and live there. But many of them did. And then a tremendous famine took place. It's recorded in Acts chapter 11. And when that happened, now even the, the folks who had homes in the area were running out of, out of resources. And so the churches in Asia and Europe determined to send relief to Jerusalem. And in 2 Corinthians, that second letter to that same group, Paul wrote to them oh, quite a bit about this in chapters 8 and 9. Paul had in mind not only the goal of meeting the needs of his own people, Paul spending much of his life in Jerusalem. He knew those people. He knew their needs. And he wanted to meet their needs. But he also had in mind unifying the worldwide church of his day. Through this offering, picture Gentiles and Jews working together as one in Jesus. This monetary gift, it's just, it's just money, but this was meant to be an outward sign of an inward reality, <coughs> selfless love. That's the point of this first offering, gathering it up. And how were they, they to do it? So that's why they were to do it. How were they to do it? In verse 2, on the first day of every week, each of you. Notice that. The early church was already meeting every Sunday. Otherwise, why would he say that? On the first day of the week, every one of you set aside some. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Also, think about this. Pentecost was celebrated on the first day of the week. So the Holy Spirit baptized the apostles and that first group of believers on a Sunday. So we have that as, a, as a, an established pattern by this time. And then the next thing to note is each person could participate. It says clearly, in keeping with his income, as the Lord has made him or her to prosper. Giving is an act of worship. We don't talk about it every week. In fact, even as we were having our, uh, uh, what do we call it, bread and broth, a Wednesday evening, sitting around a table, enjoying each, each other's company, but enjoying food, which had to be bought. And most of you, I don't know if you thought about it, but nobody asked for any money. Why? Because the folks that made the soup didn't ask to be reimbursed. They just did it. Okay? And, and that's happened weeks, weeks in a row. No offering taken. Why? Because we're, we're gathering to enjoy one another's company. And those people that provided the soup did it as an act of worship. That's what it was. That was what it was about. Giving is an act of worship. All believers are called to participate. No one should be left out. And it doesn't matter how small your offering it is. If it is given to the Lord with gratitude in your hearts, 
Think about back, back up all the way to when Jesus was first born. Luke records that when Jesus' parents brought him to the temple to be circumcised, when he was eight days old, you know what's commanded that they should bring? They should bring a lamb. But could they afford a lamb? No. And so the Lord had made an accommodation for people who couldn't afford a lamb. And it was two turtle doves or two pigeons, whatever they could get. So if you couldn't afford a lamb, you brought what you could get. Two little, little birds. That's nothing like a lamb, but that's what they brought. So we know that Jesus didn't come from uh, riches either. Don't let your income hinder your worship. During his earthly ministry, Jesus commended a woman who could only give two small coins. You remember that? I think we call it the widow's mite. Right? She brought just a, a tiny offering. And Jesus called it out to his apostles. I don't know if to the whole crowd. I don't think, I, that would have embarrassed the living daylights out of her. But, but, but he said, she just gave more than all of these. And I'm sure they were curious. What, what do you mean? He said, because these all give out of their abundance. She gave out of her need. Some of us have been blessed with more than just meeting our needs. Notice that the Apostle Paul, does, he makes no emphasis, no mention of any percent. The Apostle Paul was raised studying the Old Testament. He knew about the tithe. In the Old Testament, it was required that the people would, should pay 10% to the Lord. Why? Because that's what God said. He said, I, I want you to bring the tithe into the storehouse, 10%. The Apostle Paul didn't record that. He leaves it completely out. This was, it wasn't out of ignorance. It was out of, on purpose, saying, that, you know what, that's under the law. You're not under the law. I'm not going to require these Corinthians to bring 10%. But he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't mention less, and he doesn't mention more. He says, as the Lord prospers you. Why is that? Because maybe for some people, 10% is meager. That's... That's not, a, that's not enough. Maybe it's 12, 16. I don't even want to throw out percentages. Because that's, it's limiting to think that way. If we think, oh, God only, he only requires 10%, then, then we give that. Actually, I wish our government would come up with a percent. That would be great. <laughs> we won't even go there. <laughs> but, but the thing is, Perhaps you're called to worship the Lord with a higher, higher percentage. 2 Corinthians 9, I just want to read this to you. I know we'll, some, someday we'll get there too. 2 Corinthians 9 is about this same offering. And I'll just read, uh, I don't want to read the whole chapter. So just verses 5. Um, Paul, at this point, thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you now it's the same offering he's talking about. He sent some of the brothers, some of his helpers ahead to urge you um, and in advance, to arrange in advance for the gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. That's in the English Standard Version. So he says, I'm not trying to draw money. I'm not trying to force money out of you. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, so the point isn't how much. The point is how, can, how much can you give and, and worship and do it cheerfully. And so that's what God's asking for. Now, word of caution. We're commanded to take care of the needs of those in our home. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for his relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So we need to be careful. We need to be wise. 
All through 1 Corinthians, I want you to know this, over and over and over again, the Apostle Paul is commanding these Gentile believers to be wise, to think about what they're doing. The Christian faith is not just all pie in the sky. It's how does the Lord work through us using wisdom uh, and, and living this life in a wise way. So we can't neglect what needs to take place at home. That's important. And then we give as we are able. Notice that the Apostle Paul wanted to ensure that the offering was carefully and honestly transported. What did he say? He's, he, he said that I'm not necessarily going to take this offering from you. I want you to elect people from among your congregation. They're going to be the ones in charge of bringing the offering to Jerusalem. Why? So no questions could be raised about what happened to the money. Right? You're going to take this offering? You guys, you pick. So I'm not going to tell you who. You pick people you trust. They'll transport this offering to Jerusalem. These were the days before email. There was no electronic banking. Okay? There wasn't anything like that. They had to physically take the offering to Jerusalem. It was going to be a long trip. And he wanted to make sure it actually gets there. And if it didn't, they would know who, who had it last, okay? So he asked the local church to elect ele representatives to help deliver the gifts. No one could question what really happened to the money. Everything was to be done in a transparent and above reproach manner. And that's the same thing we try to, to do things here at, at this church. Our finances should be open to the public. Everyone should know what it is that happened to the money. We must be wise in our giving. Each one of us is still commanded to give. Now I want to, for, for you in particular, you need to know that for our Easter offering, which is coming up, I think you're, you might have already gotten or you're getting a letter that will say that our half of our Easter offering has been designated to go to the Providence Rescue Mission. You might say, well, why? Why, why send it elsewhere? Well, because the Lord is meeting our needs here. We don't have excess by any means. But the Lord is meeting our needs. We can see that. And so we're following the example of the early church. We're saying send some of this to others who are doing the work of the Lord too. So as a congregation, we're sending some of this offering to the Providence Rescue Mission. We're following the example of the early church. We each need to ask ourselves, how can I participate in worship through my giving each week? Okay, I'll leave it, that question with you and then we'll move on to the next. So with our finances, worship the Lord. With our opportunities, let's worship the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 5-9, Paul speaks of the opportunities that he had available to him. He's trying to use his time wisely. Where do I have opportunity? And he called, he, he had what he called an open door of ministry in Ephesus to preach the gospel and to disciple believers. But notice that he doesn't view opposition or adversaries as a problem, but as an opportunity. He's a funny guy. He's been arrested and thrown in jail before. And when people oppose him, he thinks, well, here comes another opportunity. Where is the Lord leading me now? Paul was living out Jesus' command to love your enemies and to do good to those who persecute you. Think about that. He lived that every day. Love your enemies. He was trying to do it. And he was also through, think about how he said what he said. Uh, if the in where is it verse seven? If the Lord permits, right? I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Uh, and then elsewhere uh, in verse five, he says, uh, "I intend to pass through Macedonia." He's living out what James wrote about in James chapter four. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. 
Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Right? What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That's what James taught. And you see that the Apostle Paul is living that out. He's thinking, well, if the Lord leads, then I'll get to do this. I intend to do this. He laid out his plans. And as it turns out, when we read through Acts and, and we see his letter to the second letter to the Corinthians, we know he got delayed. Things didn't work out the way he planned. But he and, and people accused him of lying. He said, I, I wasn't lying. I'm trying to make my plans. And sometimes the Lord has other plans in mind. Does the apostle know everything that's going to happen in the future? No. He's a human, like the rest of us. He makes his plans. God directs his steps. And we need to think the same way. We pray, Lord, show me what goals I can have for this year. What can I do? How can I be effective for you? And then we leave it to the Lord. We make our plans. God directs our steps. We each need to ask ourselves, what opportunities has the Lord given me today? How can I use this day to glorify Him? And the, the final thing is people. And really this goes from this point in chapter 16 all the way through to the end. We'll talk more about it next week. Timothy, Paul said, was doing the work of the Lord. And yet he apparently tended to get anxious and fearful to feel rejected and belittled. It seemed to be just part of Timothy's makeup. He was not a bold guy, and yet the Lord's calling him to do bold things. And Paul's saying, he commands the Corinthians, put Timothy at ease. You know, put him at ease. This poor guy, make sure he has nothing to fear. They were also commanded to help him on his way. So again, this is bringing up resources for the return trip. Supplying Timothy's needs. It might mean food, clothing, extra money for his journey. Whatever he needs. Help him on his way. This is letting out Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We need to ask ourselves, whom can I encourage in the Lord today? How can I glorify God by meeting someone else's needs? That's an important thing. We need to think about it. So, in summary, let me say, God is calling us to be very aware of the people that He's placed around us. We've talked about that. In our, in our church covenant, it says, walk circumspectly. It means, like, look, realize you're with people. Look around. What do people need? How should we help them? How should we guard them? guide them? Be aware of the people that He's placed around you. God is calling us to make good use of the opportunities that He gives us each day. And finally, God is calling us to wisely use the money, the financial resources that He's given us to bring glory to His name. Each week, each day, each of us can do something to support the work of the Lord and to bring glory to His name. I want to make sure you, over and over again, you hear this part of 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I want to end with, and I know it's, it's only actually, a little story that they do with that book. Andy and I have been reading this book, Made for His Pleasure, by Alistair Begg. And in it, he shares several great uh, tales, uh, actual happenings. And so I want to end with this so that you think about this. Eric Little. Eric Little um, competed in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And he was thought to have his best chance at a gold, gold medal in the 100 meter race, which is a kind of a sprint. When the schedules were posted, he discovered that the race was to take place on a Sunday. It was well known that 
little would not break the Sabbath. And great pressure was put on him to make an exception for this one event. He refused. If it meant that he would lose the chance at a medal, so be it. But Little was also scheduled to run on a different day in the 400 meter race. And that race he entered and won. Years after his Olympic victory, he was asked to explain his success. It was reported that he replied, the secret of my success over the 400 meters is that I run the first 200 meters as hard as I can. Okay, first 200, hard as I can. Then, for the second 200, with God's help, I run harder. Yeah. <laughs> That's how he won. Little had been born of missionary parents in, I won't even try to pronounce the town of China. It was someplace in China. Um, and after a year, and a, a year after his Olympic victory, so in 1925, he returned to that country to begin missionary service himself. He married in 1934, and in 1936 accepted an assignment to do evangelistic work in another place in China that I can't pronounce. And by this time, the Japanese had invaded China, and in 1938, Little was captured by the Japanese and placed in an internment camp at another place I can't pronounce. Conditions were very severe. And on February 21st, 1945, Little died of a brain tumor. And when the news reached the West, all of Scotland mourned. When Eric Little left for China, he did not know what lay before him. But his life was already marked by a spirit of sacrifice. He began his journey to China at Waverley Station in the center of Edinburgh. From open windows on the train, he announced to the crowd, that had gathered to see him off. Let our motto be, Christ for the world, for the world needs Christ. And then he led them in singing two verses of, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. And may his example stir us to renewed commitment. It's all about sacrifice. Our Christian life is about seeing other people's needs and trying to meet their needs. It's selflessness. Why can we do that? Because Jesus has done that for us, right? If Jesus changed my life, and now I can step forward, and my eternity is secure. I'm okay, whatever happens. I can take what, whatever resources God gives to me and bless someone else with it. Why? Because I stand in Him. What's the worst this world can throw at me? But they could take my life. To live is gain. I mean, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So it doesn't matter. And if we think that way about our money, our opportunities, the people around us, we'll be able to change the world. This is how the apostles did it in the first place. They didn't have to worry about it. Well, I don't have enough to meet my needs. It's okay. The Lord will meet our needs. So I'm challenging us to think beyond what we can see, to trust the Lord, who has proven himself faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we call out to you so often as our provider, our great God. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to trust you. Help us, oh God, to see what, we, what you've given us, to realize, Lord, that you are meeting our needs. Help us, Lord, to take that step of faith, to do what you call us to do. Help us, Lord, not to be hindered by what we see, but to walk by faith. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would increase our faith. Help us, Lord, to know that you're there, to know that you see us. To know that no matter what our circumstances are, we can worship you. Lord, we can participate. We can be part of what you're doing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've invited us. Lord, you've said, whoever, 
puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not worthy of me. Help us, Lord, not to turn back, but to step forward and to keep stepping forward by faith. Holy Spirit, empower us for this work. Lord, help us to glorify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this body with the resources you give us. Lord, we trust you. Glorify yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like more information about anything you heard today or to inquire about online giving, you can reach us online at www.woodlawnri.org or meet with us on Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. at 337 Lonsdale Avenue in Pawtucket. May God richly bless you.